Welcome back, everyone. Today is Tuesday, June the 13th. I'm Ryan Hill. I'm John Galantis. You're listening to Clearview Today with Dr. Abedan Shah, the daily show that engages mind and heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can visit us online at clearviewtodayshow.com, or if you have any questions for Dr. Shaw or suggestions for new topics, send us a text at 252-582-5028, or you can email us at contact at clearviewtodayshow.com. That's right, and you guys can help us keep the conversation going by supporting the show, sharing it online, leaving us a good review on iTunes or Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasting content from. We're going to leave a link in the description so you can do just that. And the verse of the day today comes from Psalm 28, verse 9. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. Mm. Bless your inheritance. We don't think we don't typically think about us being like what does that sound? We are his portion, yeah. his inheritance. Yeah. We don't think about that. It's mm-hmm. not something that we tip, we typically think that we are the beneficiaries through grace, of course, but that we're the beneficiaries. We're the ones who benefit. And I mean, does God benefit from a relationship with us? I don't know that He can benefit anymore. But it's it's nice to think that you know. What it says here, save your people, bless your inheritance. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, and he, I mean, that reminds us that he delights in a relationship with That's us. Right. It's not something that he's like, yeah, okay, well, you know, here's humanity. I'll, yeah, I guess I'll, I guess I'll take care of him. Yeah. No, he delights to have a relationship with us, like a father with his children. He he loves us and he cares for us. And and I love the end of that verse too, shepherd them also and bear them up forever. That's right. It's not like God's love and his provision is going to run out one day. God is faithful to generations, to mm-hmm. thousands of years, and and even more than that. I mean, he is he is a never stopping. Um, I don't know if you read this with your kids, but the Jesus Storybook Bible does a great job of illustrating this love of God. Uh, it talks about the love of God as a never stopping, never giving up, always and forever kind of love. Oh, that's and nice. it uses that over and over through the different stories of the Bible to describe the kind of love that God has for mm-hmm. His people. Yeah, God's love. God is eternal, and His love for us is eternal. And so our worship is designed to be something eternal. And that's why I like about this. Uh, you know, the Psalms. That They've, they've lasted through the generations. They're going to be here long after we're gone because God's people can't help but worship him. Right. Um, Speaking of something that someone can't help but doing. Sure. Um, I, I've i got to revisit this because this has been since we, you you've, you guys have heard us talk about on the show, the staff retreat that we just came back from. Oh, yeah. Uh, from South Dakota. Yeah, I already know what you're um, saying. One of the topics of discussion, of, of heated debate has uh, been. Yeah, I'm, I'm still angry. David's ability to take a bison and in win. a fight and win so, and so win. we the house we got into the house we were staying at had like a mounted bison's head on the yeah. wall full Which scale was very cool it was cool but it was huge yeah and so you see it and you're like oh wow this animal is truly a behemoth yeah and um david for some reason was like I can take that. That's yeah. not, it's not that big. I mean, it's big. Yeah, but I, I can, can beat I can, it. I can a fight. beat that. I can beat. And that so everybody just kind of laughed him off. Ha ha ha. But then he kept going. He was like, "I'm serious." Yeah, I could like I like take I it. could take it. Like if we find one, I'm like if I'm we find fight one. It. Yeah, if we find one, I, I, I'll, I'll fight it. Like I'm I'm not gonna fight it for real. Like, but I could and win. Yeah. And so then people Unless were you like, guys "Dare me to?" Then in which case, I will fight. And it then for real. and then people like Katie and Chris Jones and Melissa and everybody was like, "David, you know, I mean, you're joking." Like. Is, I mean, if it's a joke, that's fine. But and I was like, he, I don't think he's joking, guys. He thinks he can take a bison. Yeah. Do you want to weigh in? Because I don't want to just put words in your mouth. You did say and still claim that you can fight a bison, right? I think that I could fight and beat a bison. I mean, that's that's all I got to say. Is I mean, it's not that I'm stronger than a bison. A bison is like ten times stronger than me. Mm-hmm. It's faster than me. Mm-hmm. It can jump higher than me. Sure. It's bigger than me. Sure. It but, can run fast. It's like can run what thirty five something miles an hour. Thirty five yeah. miles an hour. Yeah, it can. So, ju- it's got a six foot vertical from a standing right, still right, position. Right. So it's not that I think that I'm like better than a bison in those aspects. Like mm-hmm. none of me. I, I'm not that prideful to think that I'm bigger and stronger than a bison. But I but, can beat a bison. You sound way more humble now than you did in South Dakota. Well, I can say that because I'm going to finish out by saying I can beat a bison in a fight because I can outwit it. I can outsmart a bison. Okay, so let's... Put Why a, do you think that, first of all? Why do you think you can outsmart a bison? Because I can. I'm a human. Oh! oh. I have, like, I have the ability to think and actually, like, strategize. A bison just acts on I can, instinct. I can breathe underwater. How do you know? Because I'm smarter than water. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'm a, no, human, be- I'm a human being. I'm smarter can- than water. <laughs> Water doesn't have any intelligence, I can so I can beat, outsmart the water yeah. and just maintain my breath. I could outsmart water. Mike Tyson. In fact, you, I can. I can. I, pr- I probably am smarter than Mike Tyson. Yeah, but Mike Tyson's also a human. 
who has like the the fight smarts and he has like the strategic right. mind. Dave, let me pose this this addendum also, to you, the Also if if you okay. you are smarter than water and you can breathe underwater with the right apparatus, you can actually But you do said that. if you stepped into a ring with a bison and all you had is a knife. That's that's my question. Like what is the, what are the parameters of this fight? Are we fighting like in a prairie yeah, or dude, are we if fighting I take a, in a like a cage match? Like if what I are we take doing? a rocket propelled grenade out onto the prairie, I could totally take a bison. Like of no problem. But David said in a ring with a knife. Yeah. In Why? a ring with a knife, Why? you can What okay, a bison's charging at you. What do you do? I I, I dodge. How do you dodge? I do you jump. just step out of the way? No, I don't step. I like r- I like dive and roll out of the way. And so the bison turns around and st- and starts charging and you just keep doing that? No, so I like wait until the opportune moment, which is when I don't know. I've never been in a fight with a bison. But you're so confident in your abilities that you will go into the ring with a bison not knowing how to defeat it, and you say, I can still defeat I it. Can, I can yeah. absolutely do this, guys. A behemoth. This thing is a monster, David. Yeah. Also, also, you know they have horns, right? Yeah. Like, they're not just... It's not just going to headbutt you. Like, that will that will 100% impale you. Like, right. imagine... You got to look out for the horns. Imagine, like, the biggest idiot that you've ever seen in real life, and mm-hmm. the bison is... 10 times stronger than that idiot. It doesn't matter how much you Yeah, it's going to be it's extremely strong and I'm not saying I'm going to win with ease. I'm not thinking it's going to be like an easy fight. I'm just saying it's winnable. I, I don't can, know how much time we can devote to to this, but it's making me angry. And I, look, it's, all I want to end with <laughs> is like when you read like stories it's making me angry. Like from history or from the Bible, you see that like these men, they have won fights with lions, with bears like David or like uh even from history, like a non-biblical account, like Lysimachus was thrown into their, um, a den with a lion and came out victorious. So I can beat a bison. I'm not as good as those guys, but I can. I think I can beat a bison. I guess it doesn't really matter what we say, because we've been arguing about this for a week and he hasn't changed his mind. What do you guys listening think? Let us know Let if us you know. think David can beat a bison. Look, David, are you, you buff? You don't know what a bison Am is. Buff? Are you buff? Just for anybody who's listening on the radio who's never seen you, are you buff? Uh, I'm not as buff as I could be, but I'm pretty strong. I'm not like really David, super David's strong. pretty strong. He is pretty strong. It's not a matter how strong he is. Is he buff? What What do you mean by buff? Like if a, if if a, a, if a, if a buffalo's like, horn impaled you, is it going to be caught on muscle or is it going to go straight through do your you flesh? Do you put the buff in buffalo? <laughs> I put the, you know what? Call me Mike Bison because I can be. I can <laughs> Unbelievable. Be Let's end on that. All right, I'm we gotta go angry. get Doctor Shot. I'm getting and angry. I want to see debate. what he thinks. Let us know what you guys think. If enough people agree with me that I could beat a Bison, we might make like David beaten Bison merch. I'll say that. No, if, if enough people agree with you, I say let's put your money where your mouth is. Let's fly a Bison in <laughs> to the studio. <laughs> Should we release a bison in the studio? Absolutely not. If you guys think we should release a bison in the studio, let us know by sending us a text at 252-582-5028. Please say no. It's going to be very dangerous. We're going to get Dr. Shaw and see what he thinks about this debate. We've got a great episode planned for you guys today. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. Hey, everyone. My name's Ellie. And I'm David. And we want to take a minute and let you know how we can actually serve you as you're listening to Clearview today. The Bible paints an extraordinary picture of who we are as a church body. The mission of Clearview Church is to lead all people into a life-changing, ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. A huge part of leading people is praying for them. A big reason that Christians have unanswered prayers in their life is because they're not praying. You know, 1 John 5.15 says... And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If you're listening to the Clearview Today Show, we want to know how we can pray for you as well. There's a number of ways that you can get in touch with us at Clearview and share your prayer request. But the best way is by texting us at 252-582-5028. You can also send us an email at prayer at clearviewbc.org. Or you can download the Clearview app on iTunes or Google Play. You know, on that app, there's a dedicated prayer wall that helps us to get to know what's going on in your life, how we can pray for you, and how we can take any necessary steps to get you moving in the right direction. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Clearview Today with Dr. Abadan Shah, the daily show that engages mind and heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can visit us online at clearviewtodayshow.com, or if you have any questions or suggestions for new topics, send us a text to 252-582-5028. 
That's right. And if today's your first time ever joining in with us at the Clearview Today Show, we want to welcome you, let you know exactly who's talking to you today. Dr. Abadan Shah is a PhD in New Testament textual criticism, professor at Carolina University, author, full-time pastor, and the host of today's show. You can find all of his work on his website. That's abadanshah.com. I'm a little flustered. I'm sorry. I'm still just kind of reeling from the nonsense that was the intro this morning. Oh, Dr. Yes. Shah, I, I I need you to weigh in here. I, I, oh. I need you to settle this. <laughs> What's going on? Once and for all, can David fight a bison? We heard this all in hold South on, Dakota. Hold on now. Fight or win? Win. Fight, fight or oh, beat yeah. a bison. Sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sure you can fight I, one. Because <laughs> any of us can fight a bison. <laughs> it's just how the outcome of that fight we is going to go. We dealt with this all in South Dakota. I'm so sick of arguing it. Just once and for all, can he beat a bison? N now, uh, let's just go back for a moment. Uh, okay. How did the Native Americans fight the bison? They fought him on horseback. By in a large pushing group it off and pushing, pushing it off, him a off, a cliff. Cliff. off a cliff yeah just just hurting and then, yeah it was just kind of sad to think about but yeah. that's what they did and that was their food yeah. you know that was their clothing and all that so is that what he's planning on doing no he's planning on stepping into a ring and fighting a bison yeah he, his thing is i'm i can outsmart the bison therefore i'm i'm i, I can win my my in, argument in was close combat my argument was what happens if i'm smarter than mike tyson can i beat him uh, no 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 so so, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, no, I don't think it's so. not gonna. Happen. It's not gonna happen. And I, and we've already gotten th two or three texts since the intro of people writing in and telling us. Yeah, people happen. are mostly concerned for David's safety. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to I wanted to bring this up with you, Doctor. Yeah. It has nothing at all to do with fighting bison's, but uh, I'm I'm taking a class right now. You and I have kind of talked about this a little bit. Sure. Um, it's a Christian. It's Christian theology too in my undergrad degree. And um, one of the questions that we were asked, we were asked was, why was the resurrection of Jesus necessary for salvation? Mm. And so we kind of talked about it a little bit, and we wanted to talk about it on the radio show because this is something that I think people get confused about. Mm -hmm. you know, right. We're we're of the mind that the cross was the pinnacle of Christ's work on earth. That's where the work was completed. Right. But that doesn't minimize or negate the no, resurrection. Of course not. Yeah, the cross is the pinnacle. Right. Uh, I would wholeheartedly say that there are people who talk about the resurrection, but if you follow their their reasoning for mm -hmm. that, it is for the power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do it for the power's sake, mm -hmm. and it's not for the power that you know. That's the power working. No, that's the power so they can use it to do greater things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an ulterior motive way, and I'm not interested in that kind of a theology. Right. That tries to somehow make ourselves equal with God. Mm -hmm. You and I. I would mm. never be equal with God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Jesus himself said, greater things you shall do. And because I go to my Father, not greater things you're going to do on your own, mm -hmm. going out there and doing this and that. And that's a kind of a belligerent Christianity that I am, I just distance myself from that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it manifests itself not just in the resurrection discussion, but it also shows up in things like, you know, Christ's descent into hell, you know, this, mm -hmm. according to this theological way of thinking, not just the whole group, but this one particular stream that, you know, that's the way they elevate themselves, mm -hmm. that Jesus is lower and he's he is just as human as us kind of thing. Right. Or, the one we were discussing just a few days ago, Sunday evening, actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. could Jesus sin? Right. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's another one of the questions that was posed to us. Right. And I vehemently say no. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe we can talk about that in this one, too, if you yeah, want to. That's up to you guys. Why not? Why not? I mean, that's that's part of that kind of resurrection discussion is that those dual natures of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, he was able to resurrect himself. He wasn't resurrected in the way that he resurrected Lazarus. He resurrected himself with God's power. Right, well, God, the Father, raised him from the okay. grave. Okay. You know? I see. And, and now that power is working in us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the motivation some of the people have of elevating resurrection over crucifixion is for a very ulterior uh, to me it's a it's sadistic reason you know Certainly. it's sad yeah so anyway so that's a different issue but having said that mm -hmm. resurrection is a cardinal doctrine mm -hmm. of christianity mm -hmm. What does that mean that it's a cardinal doctrine it means if you go in the old testament new testament it is very prominent mm. Very important. That's okay. something, I think that's something that's key that I didn't learn until I think April when we were doing that series on the resurrection here on the Clevey Today Anastasis, show. Anastasis, yeah. And, yes, and uh -huh. I, and I. Oh, yeah. Well, the Anastasis one that you were preaching through, but also we were doing on the Clevey Today show, we were going through like the resurrection through Job, the resurrection shown in Jonah. Yeah. And I didn't mm -hmm. understand that the resurrection was an Old Testament doctrine. Yes. I thought it was primarily 
you see it in the New Testament with Jesus, with him raising Lazarus, and then with him raising the little girl, and then raising right. himself, or God raising him. I didn't realize that it's cardinal in that it's all throughout the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. All throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, Christian scholars even have suggested that this doctrine did not come until the exilic period. Mm-hmm. When they were in Babylon and Persia, that's where they learned about the resurrection. And that's baloney. Mm. That's not true. And today, if you want to, we can talk about that. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, Absolutely. how this doctrine was part of the Old Testament. And even though the words are not used, the concepts were intricately, or the concept was intricately woven into the lives of God's people. Mm -hmm. You know, all their disappointments, failures, sorrows, and doubts were ultimately hinged on the promise of the life to come. Mm. Okay? So think about that. All their disappointments. In this life you're disappointed, don't worry. In Mm -hmm. the next life, it'll be good. Uh, You failed, don't worry. There's a life coming where you won't fail. You have sorrows. Joy is coming. Mm. Maybe in this life, but definitely in the life to come. And doubts. Mm. Well, there is a better day coming. Yeah. And so with that life to come, and Jesus was the key to that promise mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of resurrection. I think that's that's kind of key for us too, because we know on this side that Jesus was the key because God's word tells us that. Right. But then I think for them in the Old Testament, everything was so different because they were looking forward to that. So yeah. to have that hope and to have that faith that there's one coming who's going to be the key, I see now why it was like their faith was counted as righteousness. Right. But I, and I think that's so important for us to remember because you've said this before, Dr. Shaw, it wasn't like they were just some looking forward to some... You you know, mystery. They're like, you know, maybe there's there's someone or something that's going to happen that might save. No, they they understood quite a lot about who Jesus yeah. was and and the eventual the Messiah that was coming and what what was what that was going to mean for them. We they, we think of them as some sort of primitive people that don't have their act together and they're just yeah. sort of banging rocks together. But they were very sharp and understood quite a lot. Well, yesterday, just my day off, I decided to just read what I wanted to read. So I was reading about. Gerhardus Vos, okay? He was a biblical theologian, uh, kind of a head of the Reformed world. And again, I want to agree with everything that he said, but man, he, is, he was an amazing theologian. Mm. He wrote on, on biblical theology of the Old and New Testament, Pauline eschatology. Uh, he was a man sort of living in two worlds, and I don't want to get into that too much right now. But, but just, y- you know, reading and, and studying him and... And just knowing um, the depths to which uh, the the Jewish people at the time of Jesus believed about the resurrection, you know, Paul in eschatology he sort of talks about that. It's unbelievable. Mm. I mean, like Paul. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. Acts twenty four fourteen. When he is defending himself, listen to what he says. He said, "But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers." Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, Mm -hmm. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. He's saying that that what I believe is not so foreign from what you've always believed. Right. Mm. Or my people or the Jewish people, the ones who are accusing me, we believe the same thing. I don't have no idea why they're so upset. Mm. Mm. Because Jesus is the one who has fulfilled it all, so we can have the hope that we've been waiting for, and our forefathers have been waiting for for ages. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's the thing that I think always got me was that Jesus comes along, He fulfills everything. It's like you said, they're not blind to it. They're not like I, I don't know, I don't know who this guy. Like they know that the Messiah is coming. He's doing all these things, and yet yeah. still they they have to choose not to like it. They have to choose not to accept it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not that he didn't fulfill it or whatever and that they're shocked. It's that they're for some reason choosing yeah. to not accept this Messiah chose, that they've been waiting for all this time. Right. He chose not to regard him as the fulfillment. Right. In Acts twenty four twenty, he says the same exact thing. This is Paul defending himself. He says, or else let those who are here themselves say, if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, Unless it is for this one statement, which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Hmm. He's, he's, I think, I think I'll see what you're saying. He's, he can't believe they're trying him on that doctrine, which they agree on. Yeah. Yeah, What, what, what are you doing? We both agree on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have a problem with Jesus. 
who is fulfilling everything that you're waiting for. Right, mm. right. If it were such a foreign concept to them, then Paul wouldn't be so shocked. Right. Yeah, there wouldn't be any common ground. It would be like, this is a, this is a completely outlandish thing. Paul yeah. is saying, this is not outlandish. We're both agreed on this. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Acts 23 and verse 6. This time, he is kind of going back or uh, he's, or maybe one more. Acts 26, verse 6 first. He says, uh, before King Agrippa and his wife, you know, Festus is there as well. He says, uh, now I stand and I'm judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Now, how else can you take that? Mm -hmm. That's true. He said, I'm being judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes. In case you think the fathers maybe just a generation earlier, he's like 12, 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, 10 of them are already lost by now. Oh, I forgot about that. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Right? That was Assyrian exile. They were lost. Yeah, Assyrian exile, 12 are gone. Yeah, that's true. And even after out of the other two, you know, most of them never came back. Mm -hmm. So earnestly serving God day, night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Hmm. Yeah. Why is it a big deal? What, yeah. what am I saying? Why is that offending anybody? Don't we believe this? Yeah. We've had the same thoughts here li lately on another doctrine of baptism. Yeah. That, that, uh, yeah. Why like, are people so up in arms about this? I thought we were all agreed on this. Yeah. Like, it, like to me, that's how it came across when we, when we made that statement. And I know we're going to talk about that on the show another day, but there was a big hoopla about when you said, you know, baptism doesn't save people. It points to the, there, there's nothing magical about the water. To me, I was like, of course. Yeah, I, I don't understand why people are angry about that, and I I, I kind of see what Paul is yeah. is getting at here. Yeah. He's like, yeah. you and really? I know, we, I know we're going to come back to the baptism. I'll just say this very quickly: anytime anyone anywhere begins to add something to the work done by Jesus and Jesus alone, anathema. Yeah, I will mm -hmm. not join them. That's right. On that. That's right. It is by grace through faith alone. Moment you bring anything else in there, it's over. Amen. Yeah, yeah only by faith you can receive it. Mm -hmm. Right. You cannot add to it. So, anyways, let's leave that alone. Yeah, yeah, for I was going to say, <laughs> for, for people listening to the show who have no clue what we're talking about, you will in a few weeks. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah. address it. So, and again, in Acts 23, 6, which is kind of hearkening back to an earlier point when G, when Paul was standing before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, he says, uh, Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, the other Pharisees. He cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Hmm. <laughs> He is kind of splitting the Sadducees and the Pharisees at that point. Did the Sadducees believe in resurrection? No. But but Pharisees did. Pharisees did. And Paul, uh, okay, so he's, okay. he's drawn the battle line here. Yeah, he's yeah. like getting people to go, wake up. These guys are not on your side. Y'all are go united against me, but you don't realize the people you're united with don't believe like you do. Right. I see, I see. Because the Pharisees believed. So he was like, hey, guys, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the I'm a a, son of a Pharisee, too. Yeah. So you guys believe in the resurrection. Why are you trying me for believing in the resurrection? The guys you who are yeah. who are holding hands with you don't believe in the resurrection. Right. Mm. Get away from them. <laughs> I see. I he's, see. he's like causing a, a split. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Dividing the dividing and conquering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus did the same thing, too. You know, he... um. When the Sadducees tried to trick him with questions about the resurrection, you know, he, he said it very clearly, Matthew 22, 29, you are mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. Now, don't think angels like spirit beings. Mm -hmm. Don't think angels here implies these, you know, sort of robotic creatures. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. They are, to the contrary, what he's saying here is that they don't they're not supposed to procreate mm -hmm. right at one time they broke that rule mm -hmm. and they are being held in prison for that day of judgment coming up uh so here don't think angels meaning just weird robotic beings but they do not marry right mm. And then verse 31, he says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. 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 That's mm. right. Yeah. He's quoting from Exodus 3, 6. Wow. You mentioned something earlier about, about like biblical scholars thinking that the resurrection didn't happen until like after the exile. Was that the Babylonian exile? Yeah, the they're talking about that. Like they had, they learned it from the Zoroastrians, the mm -hmm. Parsis, and you know in Persia, but that's that's yeah. not not true. 
or they were influenced by the Greek of, you know, the idea of the domain of the dead. Yeah. And again, this is not mm. true. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, you know, this, this is, this is just completely, um, uh, Contrary to what we find in scripture. Well, I mean, we even talked about there's resurrection themes in Job. I mean, if Job is the oldest chronological book in the yeah. Old Testament, and there's resurrection themes in there, then absolutely. How in the world? I'm, I'm guessing Job was written in way my before flesh. The, I shall see God. Right, <laughs> right, right. I'm guessing that Job was written before the Babylonians. I'm not a scholar, but yeah, not, not the Babylonians, but the seems exile. like that tracks. Yeah. The best uh, that I've found in scholarship is that he wrote pretty much after the flood. Mm. Wow. One of the first ones to write. I mean, he's talking about the Leviathan. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the mm -hmm. sea monsters. I mean, so he's talking about a period where some of the last of those dinosaurs are still around, mm -hmm. right? Who survived the flood, you know, in the waters. And and Job is referring to them. And, he's, and he talks about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But I know that after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. What was the motivation for people to move the resurrection after the Babylonian exile? Well, this is, okay, that's sort of I was going to talk about with Gerhardus Vos. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, what he said, kind of going off of his old mentors when he was studying in Germany and all that, is that no one does theology in isolation. Mm. It is always in a philosophical construct. Mm -hmm. It's always in some kind of a philosophical uh, milieu, right? Climate. Mm -hmm. And the climate that has been in the past 200 years is very evolutionary. The doctrines evolve. They don't just happen. They evolve. And if you go by that thinking, then you need evolution when it comes to resurrection. You, yeah. need, the, you need the idea of evolution when it comes to resurrection. So... How did they have it? They didn't have it in the beginning. But then in time, and they went to Babylon, that's where they learned it, and then they fleshed it out, and then Daniel really expanded on it. And then by the time of Jesus and Paul, it's all this big elaborate Anastasis mm -hmm. doctrine. Mm -hmm. I, I refuse to believe that. Yeah, yeah. because I, I, then Genesis 3.15 sort of loses all of its weight. You know right, I mean? if, yeah. like, like if he said that Christ is going to do this, it implies that the resurrection follows, mm -hmm. but then that loses its weight if it didn't come along until much later. Right. You know what I mean, what was God's plan? That Jesus would defeat Satan and then like he would just stay dead? Yeah. Now, I agree that some doctrines are present in a germ form, mm -hmm. okay? I, I'm okay with that. Some doctrines are not full-fledged yet because the people can understand them at that point. Mm -hmm. Not that they are incapable of, but they don't have enough experiences mm -hmm to live out those doctrines. That makes so in the early, early, like Cain and Abel, how deep did they understand the life, you know, in Christ? Right, right. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Why? Because not enough time. Mm -hmm. You know, he killed him. So it's, <laughs> yeah. so it's not enough time to, to really <laughs> flesh that out. But, but, right. would you agree that Enoch understood about the resurrection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. I was, I, That's a good I, point. You know, understood yeah. so much that he didn't even want to die, mm -hmm. in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. So God took him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He walked with God and then was no more. And then was well, no, no more. more. <laughs> and they looked for him. Yeah. One thing you said, um, and I think we've said it on the podcast as well, but I know you've said it from the pulpit, is that we tend to think that death is a natural thing. Mm, we, yeah. Because we've been told that so much, that death is natural, guys. This is part of life. And mm. the sooner you accept it, you know, you'll you'll start to find poetry in it. You'll start to find beauty in it. You'll write songs about it. You'll make movies and stories about it because it's just the natural part of the way things are. But God mm -hmm. says something very opposite. It's a punishment. Mm -hmm. It's a punishment. Yeah. I mean, he says that right here. Very first book, second chapter. It says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mm. There is your reason for death. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's disobedience. Yeah. It's disobedience and it's separation and it's desire, I think, to be like God mm -hmm. and to transcend the, the structure that he's laid out for your life. Yeah. Well, that juxtaposition, like you can live forever or you can cut your life short. Those are your choices. Mm -hmm. you, you can't have both. You, you can live forever or you, you can end your life. I mean, even think about what death is. Death, yeah. by its nature, is the end of life. It's not a part it's of life. It's a horrible interruption. That's yeah. right. That's right. And it was never 
part of the design. There's something that you said in um, in one of the books that we're writing that's going to be coming out soon, but that, you know, God, it's not that physics and entropy and all that stuff was created as a result of the fall, but in his masterful planning, God, you, God balanced out all all of that stuff absolutely uh, during creation yeah. you know what i mean yeah absolutely maybe we can cover that in one oh, of yeah, our I would episodes love to. i would love to but death is a punishment mm, oh, you know yes. when god came and the enemy lied to them and said oh you shall surely not die but when god came in genesis three seventeen through 19 i mean the final punishment is for dust you are and to dust you shall return mm-hmm. i mean imagine how horrible that is i'm full of life and vigor and vitality and I'm going to be dust yeah. again. Yeah. Oh. And we see that in the way that, like in the Old Testament, you know, they're not they're not just like la di da with corpses or dead bodies. No. They treat it as though it's a punishment. Yeah. You know, like yeah. like thing. growing up, going to the uh, cemetery, we came back and had to take a shower. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing. I don't know if we've talked about that on the podcast, but that interested me when you when you said that. Like growing yeah. up, because like here, like there, <laughs> like there's a. There's like a party after, not a party. Like Mima like will cook. Yeah, Mima's gonna, gonna cook. Everybody's gonna, gonna come mm-hmm. over, spend the day together. We're gonna eat. We're gonna hang out. Preacher, laugh, come on over. Stories. We got plenty of fried chicken. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, really? That's not how it was. Is when everybody you were gonna take up? a shower before that? <laughs> no, no, we got it all ready. Oh, we nasty, all, we got it. Uh, y'all filthy come people, on. you. <laughs> <laughs> it was not like that growing up for you. Oh no, you go to the funeral uh, like a cemetery. Mm-hmm. There is no funeral home mm-hmm. where I grew up. There is no such thing as a funeral home. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you may have funeral services, mm-hmm. but they bring the casket to your home. It's in a refrigerated box. I mean, oh, really, yeah, yeah, mm. it is. Wow, and they plug it in. So I don't know what happens if the power goes out, <laughs> but they plug it in, and it sits there refrigerated, and people can see the body. Wow, at the house, uh huh, through a glass, uh huh, and then you head to the cemetery. Now this is nowadays. Back in the old days, it the the casket was put. On a block of ice. Mm. Mm. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. And there's a tray underneath. And they would bring it to the house? Yeah, they would put, set it up and you know, had like like cloths on the side so you don't see how yeah. the water is dripping from yeah. the big blocks of ice. The body's on top of that. Mm-hmm. And then this wooden like a, a lid on top. And you just walk in by looking at it. But you can hear the water dripping. Oof. Wow. wow. Oof. The body is kept on ice. And then that's how I remember back in the in the eighties. And then you would go to the cemetery, and then afterwards take a shower. Yeah, not that the water would be all over you, anything like no, that. No, 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 I know that, that's mean. a whole different thing. So once that is done, when it's time to head to the cemetery, they would put the body in 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 the box, mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm, casket, mm-hmm. and then th- they would take it to the cemetery. Wow. And once they bury, you know, when you leave, and the burial is such that you, you everybody p- picks up a clot of dirt and throws it in there. Really. Oh yeah! Oh yeah. wow! Did yeah. you do that as a kid? You throw you would throw the tons of time. Wow! Wow! <laughs> it's very surreal when you're doing it. I can imagine. Here you don't. Here the funeral director is like everybody put the little boutonniere. Here. Yeah, the little flower. Yeah, yeah you put yeah. the flower. It's on It's very the very dignified. Growing up is very harsh. See, I don't think mm-hmm. I've ever even seen the casket lowered. We always we would leave and then they put the casket. In oh the no ground. no no! The casket goes down. Wow! And then you throw the. Dirt on Throw it. Throw the dirt on it. Wow. And no vittles after. No party after. Well, and it also, you know, there's a lot of other things that go on, like like women will break their bangles and stuff like that. Wow. Even even Christians would do that. Hmm. It's like a sign of mourning, no more joy left. Wow. I like I like the, the Western ones <laughs> way <Yeah>. better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keeps things a little bit lighter. But I mean that that recaptures that idea that death is not natural. Death it's is not natural. Death. Here we've made it like it's all peaceful, good. It's all good. Mm-hmm. It's all worked out for the best. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. No. There's some, <laughs> there's some weight behind it. Death is not natural, which points us back to why the resurrection was so necessary, such Amen. a crucial part Amen. of of salvation. And I know we're going to talk about this on on Absolutely. future episodes. So, if you, but if you guys have any questions in the meantime or suggestions for a future episode, send us a text to two five two five eight two five zero two eight. You can visit us online at clearviewtodayshow.com. Join with us. Uh, you can. Sponsor us financially on that same website. Click that donate button. Let us know it's coming from Clearview Today. We count you as part of our Clearview Today show family as we're impacting the nations with the gospel. We love you guys. We'll see you next time on Clearview Today. 